And we're going to take a few moments to recognize this major Supreme Court ruling that was issued today. The High Court rejected a constitutional challenge to the Indian Child Welfare Act. The decision is seen as a major victory for tribes and tribal sovereignty, one in a series of court decisions affirming ICWA over its 45 years in existence. The National Congress of American Indians issued a statement saying the organization is overjoyed with today's ruling and that the positive impact of today's decision will be felt across generations. We're joined now by Matthew Fletcher. He's a law professor at Michigan State University's College of Law and the author of the Turtle Talk blog. He's from the Grand Traverse Band of Ottawa and Chippewa Indians. Matthew, thanks for taking time to joining us today. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here, and I really enjoyed the program on baseball. It reminds me of the year that I led the league in being hit by pitch in a Northern California hardball league not so long ago. Right, right. Okay. Well, I hope you didn't have too big a bruise from that one. Well, well. speaking of hardballs and, and fastballs and, and fast-paced stuff, I mean, wow, what, what breaking news today. And uh, what's your initial reaction to the headline with regard to the, the high court's decision? Oh, it absolutely blew my mind. I was so fully expecting uh, a terrible loss and telling people that the only, the best possible scenario is only parts of the Indian Child Welfare Act get struck down today. And uh, they roundly affirmed the whole thing, seven to two. It was amazing. And the Supreme Court, you know, as concerned as, as so many of us are in Indian country, they, they just seem to be, they seem to come through for us in the 11th hour more and more, don't they? <laughs> you know, since, um, 2014, tribes have won 11 out of 16 cases, which is unprecedented in the entire history of the United States. So it's been a good run. We got McGirt a couple of years ago. Um, there have been some tough losses in there, but, um, you know, all we ask the Supreme Court to do every single time is just affirm the law that they themselves wrote over the centuries. And um, almost every time tribes lose, it's because they change something. It's kind of like the Matrix when you see a black cat go by and you're like, uh-oh, something bad is going to happen. Mm, the Matrix, I love that analogy. Well, okay, so obviously this is a huge blow against these ICWA opponents, but, I mean, you know, the concern is, are they going to appeal? Are they going to come back at the state level? So, I mean, going forward, are, are, are we clear? Are we good to go? No more worries? Or what do we need to be concerning ourselves with now, looking ahead? Well, you know, the, the court did not reach the question of whether um, an Indian Affairs statute can violate the Equal Protection Clause of the Fourth and the Fourteenth Amendment and also the Fifth Amendment. So um, we're still going to be uh, inundated probably with challenges that, you know, Indian Affairs statutes like ICWA are discriminatory against non-Indians. But um, I think it's going to be really hard for um, anybody to really challenge ICWA on that ground because it's so difficult to get a case to the Supreme Court. Um, these cases that went to the Supreme Court today have been concluded for sometimes years, and um, these cases go by fast, so it's hard to get a case to the Supreme Court. That said, there are still going to be challenges on the equal protection front. We're going to be ready for it. Expect criminal defendants to make those challenges. There's a, pe a pending challenge to the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act in Washington right now. Um, these are all equal protection challenges. Um, I, I feel fairly confident that, uh, you know, Indian country is going to prevail in most or all of these cases, but uh, it, there definitely is room for the other side to, to move forward. Now, the Goldwater Institute, Matthew, they're the prominent organization that's really been going after ICWA, and they're talking about future state challenges. Do you think they're going to get any traction there at the state level? Um. I don't know. I mean, states are the ones actually leading the charge in some respects to defend the Indian Child Welfare Act. I mean, you have up 15, at least 15 states have actually adopted it. So they're going to have to find a state where you have a judiciary that is willing to ignore the law. You're going to have to find a state where the state legislature hasn't already adopted ICWA. Um, it's going to be hard for them to really do much, but, uh, you know, they have basically infinite resources and we fully expect to hear from them again in the future. And what about some of these families that, that are, have been in limbo now or for these, you know, all this time now that this issue has been put before the Supreme Court, this challenge? Um, have you heard from any of those folks or any, any children that are directly impacted, parents, others, relatives? What are they thinking? Well, first of all, it's hard to, to know what families are thinking. A lot of times these cases are sealed, 
So we don't really aren't supposed to know that much about them. But the second thing is that these cases in the, the Brackeen litigation have been concluded. So all the adoptions are done. And uh, that's one of the reasons the Supreme Court declined to talk about equal protection in any meaningfully, any meaningful way today, because there are no pending cases. So, um, but I, I, you know, the, you know, the sad thing is three of the four children that were in, that were sort of affected by this case um, have already been adopted by non-Indians. But the family in Minnesota, the White Earth Nation family, uh, where the grand, the native grandma adopted a child, they're they're safe, and uh, now they're there's nothing to be done about going after the to undo that adoption. So at least um, we can say one family is safe today. At least mm -hmm. well, that's good news. And the supporters of ICWA, who they've been so worried, everybody has just been on pins and needles waiting for this decision and. What was it that they were, I mean, what did you think was going to happen, Matthew? What, what, was, what was kind of the worst case ruling that folks were prepared to have to accept today? The worst case ruling would have been a ruling on the equal protection grounds. Um, if they had said that any aspect of the Indian Child Welfare Act was discriminatory against non-Indians um, and applied their notion of what is called strict scrutiny to that statute, um, that, me that would have meant that... Um, Two things. One is other areas of Indian law could be subject to the same kinds of challenges, and we expect them to be made anyway, but at least there's no holding that somehow Indian affairs laws violate equal protection. But more importantly, um, you know, the, uh, if you had an equal protection holding today that was negative, then Congress and state legislatures wouldn't be able to go back and fix it. So the other provisions, the other challenges to the, the Indian Child Welfare Act could have been fixed through legislative um, enactments. And we felt fairly strongly that uh, there was a pretty good chance Congress and state legislatures, which are already adopting ICWA, would have been supportive of that, uh, of a proposal like that. But it wouldn't have been the case if the court struck down portions of the act under equal protection. Nothing would have been able to save uh, the statute then. So. That, that would have been a worst case scenario. And, you know, the court didn't even reach that question. So we're, you know, we're going to come away with a big win and look to the future. And for ICWA supporters going forward, I mean, is there any new issues there that, that they're going to have to press for with regard to ICWA? Or do you think they can just kind of take a step back and relax? Uh, what's the game plan? Well, um, there's still a lot of work to be done in various states to get ICWA codified. I think that's a project that is just getting in on its feet. Um, it's been very successful, and there are some states that are waiting, like Utah, to see what the case was going to, what the outcome was going to be, before they made a decision on whether to codify um, ICWA. And so it's time to move forward on those things. Um, there's always work to be done on ICWA. Now that we have uh, a solid constitutional basis for the statute, it's time to get states to really start complying with ICWA. Even the states that have codified it um, don't always comply with it. You know, it's, uh, it's really hard. So there's more work to be done to get lawyers for Indian families, Indian children. Um, there's not a lot of resources to uh, represent tribal citizens in ICWA cases in state court. And so more and more resources are needed, and there's still more to be done. Well, Matthew, I want to thank you again for joining us on such short notice it's always a pleasure to have you on the show and uh thank you and i hope you're able to come back in the future and talk a little bit more about this uh groundbreaking decision folks we have reached the end of our hour and i'm going to thank our guests again we have derek toledo nathan abeta joseph Sweena, and matthew fletcher we talked a little bit of pueblo baseball and the law how's that for a double header join us on native america calling again tomorrow We'll hear from more Native legal experts on the ICWA decision.